Hola. My name is Dr. Belinda Luke and I work for CAB International, CABI. And I'm delighted to be able to talk to you today about the development of a microinsecticide uh, that we used in Africa for control of locusts and grasshoppers. Firstly, I'd like to thank the organisers of this webinar for inviting me to talk. I'm very honoured to be able to do so. So the outline of the talk is I'm going to talk briefly about CABI, what biopesticides are, and then in particular what microbial biopesticides are, and then talk about locusts in South America, the Lubaloza project in Africa, how to develop a mycopesticide, early warning systems, modelling, a fire success app that we developed from a project in China, dissemination of results to the end users, and a China UAV project. So CABI is an intergovernmental, not-for-profit organisation, um, and we're based on science and information. And CABI addresses global issues such as food security, climate change, gender issues, but we do it on a local scale. CABI is quite unique. We are actually owned by our member countries, of which Chile and Colombia are members within uh, South America. If you think your country might be interested in becoming a member, then please do get in contact with us. Although CABI is a relatively small organisation with just under 500 staff, globally, we're situated across 21 locations. And you can see in South America, we're in Brazil, Peru and Chile. And it's through the local offices that we can develop really good projects, the people there can speak the language, they know the culture of the country, and we find that's a great working success for CABI. CABI has expertise in certain centres. So for example, I'm from the UK and I have expertise in biopesticides, so I can then help out Brazil, for example, in this case, to control locusts and grasshoppers. So in the UK, biopesticides are described as plant protection products which contain a biological control agents, and they're split into three different categories. Microbials, which is the top picture, pheromones, which is often relating to mating disrupting pheromones, for example, is the middle picture, and then plant extracts. And the most common one is probably neem oil, which is the bottom picture. Biopesticide is a term that covers many different categories. So we've talked about pheromones, microbials and plant extracts. Microbials are further split down to bacteria, for example, Bt, fungal, for example, metrisium or bavaria, nematodes, which are little worms, which are very good for soil pests, such as slugs, and viruses, which are very good for lepidopteran pests. Each one of these boxes has a different mode of action and different speed of kill, so it's very important to appreciate that biopesticides is a very generic term and it can be very confusing. You're all more aware of this than I am, but just as a, a recap, at the end of May this year, um, locusts crossed from Paraguay into Argentina um, and they were damaging crops, corn, sugarcane, wheat and oats. And they can travel huge distances in a day, in you know, 150 kilometres in one day. And at the end of June, a state of emergency was called in Argentina and Brazil as crops were threatened. Um, luckily, the climatic conditions um, were favourable um, or unfavourable for the locusts and they were, it was cool. So they were, became more lethargic and I know that chemicals um, were used to control them to try to reduce those numbers. And in Argentina, there's been outbreaks in 2019, 2017 and 2015, and they seem to be coming more often than what they have previously. This may be related to global warming, we're not sure, um, but obviously it's something that we need to be aware of. In 1989, CABI started a 13-year research programme looking into the biological control of locusts and grasshoppers, called Lubaloza for short. It was in response to heavy chemical use in the outbreaks of 1986 to 1989. This project was funded by multi-donors from five different countries and in total cost 10.2 million. When the project started, it had nothing. So we had to go out and find an isolate and then went through all the necessary steps to develop the commercial product, Green Muscle. Green Muscle is now readily available in Africa and is sold by Elephant Fair. Uh, Lubaloza didn't do this on their own. Um, it was very much joint collaboration, the main partners being IITA 
GIZ and the SILFS countries, um, but also the crop protection agencies um, of Nigeria, Benin, Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, Senegal and the Gambia. And this is one of CAVI's strengths, is that we always work with partners. CAVI doesn't tend to go in and try to do a project on their own. We realise the importance of having partners, having different points of view, having different skills and expertise to be able to really develop good projects. So I'm just going to briefly tell you how Green Muscle works. So you would apply your um, application the same way as you would with a chemical. So it would be either hand sprayers, knapsack sprayers, aerial spraying, whatever it may be. Ultra low volume is usually the way it's applied for uh, locust control. The spores then can either land directly onto the locust or land on vegetation and the locust will pick it up as they walk through the vegetation. And then when the spore lands on the locust, it will have a stimulation. It will recognise that it's a locust and it will put out what's called a penetration peg, which physically forces its way through the cuticle to grow with inside the locust. Now, if that spore lands on a different insect, so for example, a bee, it will not germinate and it will not penetrate the bee. So it's very host specific to just locusts and grasshoppers, which means that environmentally, that's a great benefit. Once inside the locust, it then starts to grow and it's utilizing the resources of the inside of the locust. And then after seven to 20 days, the locust will die. And if environmental conditions are favourable, i.e. there's high humidity, then you'll get external sporulation and those spores are released to go on to kill other locusts. And we call that secondary recycling. Now, locusts in uh, Africa, the Schistocerca, um, will actually eat locusts that are ill. Which, so it means if they are infected with green mussel, locusts come along and eat them and that's another way of spreading it. Now, you'll notice in the middle there, I've got this process takes between seven to 20 days. That's due to environmental parameters. So if the environmental parameters, mainly through temperature, are favourable, then you'll get kill within seven days. If the environmental parameters are not so favourable, then kill could take as long as 20 days. So if we then link this to the locust life cycle, so the locust as an adult will lay eggs, the eggs then hatch and the locusts go through five instars, uh, to develop into an adult. Now they can only fly when they are adult. So when they are what we call hopper bands, because they can't fly, they hop everywhere. This, um, they're not too much of a threat because they can't travel larger distances when you can fly. So ideally, when we're looking at green mussel, we try to inoculate them, uh, treat them as the third instar. Green mussel is effective against all the instars and the adults. However, we target third instars so that we can kill them before they become adults and before they can fly. Locusts tend to lay their eggs in undisturbed soil, so it's not agricultural land. So they hatch in undisturbed soil. In Africa, that's in desert type locations. But when they become adults, they then fly to the crops and that's when they can do the most damage. We don't tend to um, treat first an instar um, locust, mainly because they're so small. A first instar locust is about eight millimetres in size. It's very difficult to see in the field. So now I'm just going to give you some data that we collected in the field when we were doing field trials. This is from 1996. And we were looking at uh, using metarizium at 100 grams per hectare. For nitrophion, which is a commonly used chemical to control locusts and grasshoppers in Africa, at 250 grams a hectare, and we did these on 50 hectare plots. On the y-axis, you've got density, so that's the number of locusts per metre squared, and on the x-axis, you've got days after treatment. The green line is the metarizium, the biological control. The control is the white line, that's had nothing sprayed to it at all. That's just counting numbers within a set area. And then the phenytrophine is the chemical. So if we look at the control first, the white line, you can see that the numbers are pretty stable between 20 and 27 over the course of the 22 days. With the phenytrophine, you see that after spraying, you get a big knockdown of locusts. So at day four, you've got hardly any locusts left. In fact, you would have that on day one, but we didn't record 
that information. You would get instant order. Within 24 hours, the majority of locusts will be killed. But what you noticed after day seven is that the numbers start to increase. And by day 13, the numbers in the control treatment are the same as the numbers in the metarhizium treatment. And by day 19, they're the same numbers as they are in the control treatments. And this is because you have two reasons. One, you're getting locusts coming in from the surrounding areas. And you're getting other eggs that are hatching. So late development um, locusts. Now, for nitrophion, it's designed to have a short um, half-life. So once it's sprayed in the field, it breaks down quite quickly. So it means after day four, there's no phenytrophion left. So those numbers, any new locusts coming into that area, their numbers increase, they're not killed by the chemical. Now with the metarhizium, you'll see by day seven, day 10 even, there's not really much difference in the number of locusts that have been killed. And this is, you know, this is one of the problems we have is it looks really worrying to the people who apply them thinking it's not worked, we need to do something about that. However, by day 13, um, you'll see that the numbers are dropping and they drop further to day 22. What's happening here is that the metarhizium is sprayed, the locusts are picking it up, it takes a few days for them to die, they stop feeding after about three or four days because they don't feel very well, so they're actually feeding after day three or four, and then they then eventually die. It's a slow process. So that's why that slope is quite slow. But also as well, because of the sec secondary recycling I was talking about earlier, is that any new locusts coming into this area will either pick up the metarhizium that's been sprayed off the vegetation, they will um, eat the sick locusts and pick up the spores that way, or you'll have the secondary recycling where the dead locusts um, have released more spores and they're picking it up. So it means that you've got um, longer term control. Now, the following year in 1997, we did the same experiment. Well, we did it on 800 hectare plots instead of 50 hectare plots. And again, you can see similar sort of things happening. So the control with the white line, actually the control numbers increased. Um, they doubled in their density between day minus three and day 10. But by day 22, they weren't too dissimilar from the beginning. With the phenytrophion, um, you can see this rapid drop down. And as I was saying, we actually measured on day one for this field trial. You can see between day one and day four, you've got excellent control. Day six, the numbers are starting to rise. And this time at day 10, you've got the same numbers in the metarhizium as you have in the phenytrophion treatments. Now, the metarhizium actually starts to show death earlier um, this, in this field trial. So from day four to day six, you're getting a decline and by day 16 you've got very good control of locusts and grasshoppers and that's because the environmental parameters for this year were better than 1996. So that's why you're getting quicker control and again you've got that sustained control day 16 to 22 no increase in numbers. So what do you need if you're going to develop a good biopesticide? Well the most obvious thing that you need is good virulence um, in the lab if you haven't got good virulence in the lab, you're very unlikely to have that in the field. So you need to choose that as one of your factors in choosing a good isolate. And also you need to think about field persistence. So how robust is your isolate? So for example, the green mussel isolate was very robust. You could spray it in the field and we knew that it would be around in a month's time. Um, so you need to consider that if you've got an isolate that uh, is very susceptible to a slight change in temperature, then it's probably not worth taking forward as a product. Now, productivity is one of the most important things and often not thought about until right at the end. But it's important to think about it at the beginning. How easy is it to mass produce your isolate? If you want to turn it into a product, then you need to know that you can mass produce it in large quantities or else your product or any products that you develop from it are just going to be too expensive. So if you've got a very good um, virulent isolate, but it's not very good at mass production, then I would suggest not taking that isolate forward. You also need to think about stability um, in storage. So the shelf life of the product. Ideally, you want uh, six to 12 months as a minimum, possibly two years. We do know that within green muscle, 
where if it was stored at five degrees, we had greater than 80% uh, viability after seven years. And also low environmental impacts, which you generally get with biopesticides. Some biopesticides are generalists and will kill a range of insects. Green mussel will only kill locusts and grasshoppers. So you need to work out how specific you want your isolate to be. And then also field performance. There's lots of papers that say this isolate was really good in the lab, but we took it into the field and it didn't work. In the majority of time, that's linked to either formulation and or application. Um, we mass produce in a two phase system. So the first one we use uh, liquid broth, which you can see with a picture on the left. And then we move it to a solid substrate. In Africa, rice was readily available, so we use that. We use that in the UK, but you can use things like barley um, in other substrates. And then what we did initially is to separate the rice and the spores, we would hand sieve. And you can see two gentlemen on the right hand side doing that. It was a very uh, dusty and tiring job. But what we were finding is that too many large particles were getting free when sieving. So as part of the project, we developed a mica harvester, which can extract the spores from the rice without any particles getting through. Now, formulation, um, you need to have a good formulation to allow the spores to be applied effectively. You need to think about um, what do you want to achieve with your formulation? Some of the formulation uh, ingredients can enhanced the efficacy. So for example, we used oil instead of water for the locust control, it enhanced the efficacy of the canidia. But some of the um, formulation ingredients can actually harm the canidia, so you need to check that as well. And also as well, you can put UV protectants into your products, but you do need to think about the cost implications of that because that is an additional cost to the end product. And sometimes as well, um, your formulation can help enhance the uptake or the contact onto the insect. So for example, if you've got mealybugs, they've got waxy residue, can you have a formulation that will overcome that residue? And ideally, your formulation needs to com be compatible with the existing application techniques because it's very expensive for farmers to buy new sprayers. In Africa, ultra low volume application is used for locust control. We're putting on approximately one to two liters per hectare. In the original trials that Cabby carried out, we were putting 100 grams into that liquid. However, today the recommended dose is 50 grams per hectare. And if you have a very good spray team, you can get it down to 25 grams per hectare. And this is really important because if you go from 100 grams to 50 grams per hectare, you're effectively having the cost of the price of the application. So micro insecticides have some similarities with chemicals. They both require contact. They're both um, applied using conventional sprayers and they're a good IPM cool. But there's also quite a few differences and we need to appreciate that there are these differences. So the myco insecticide has a slower speed of kill. Hence why you put it on earlier so you control them before they become a pest. It's a living organism, so you need to respect that. It's got low environmental toxicity, um, where obviously chemicals may have higher toxicity, especially to non-target organisms. Um, a microinsecticide is organic versus to non-organic, and it's a particulate, so you need to think about that in your formulation. You've got particles, not a solution, as you have with a chemical. Traditionally, microinsecticides are put on as preventative, not curative, and to date, there's no evidence of resistance with a microinsecticide, where obviously we're all aware of resistance with some chemical pesticides. And also something that's often overlooked is that there's not really any cost for disposal of your containers after you've used your mycoinsecticide. You just need to burn your uh, containers. Where most chemicals require specialist disposal of their containers, which may be very expensive. And you should think about those costs when you're thinking about purchasing your product. Personal safety is something that we're very, very conscious of at Cabby. Fungal spores are proteinaceous dust. So if you suffer from allergies, for example, hay fever, you may be more sensitive to breathing in the spores. So an extra care must be taken when using large quantities of spores, especially in the preparation of the formulations. However, the only equipment you really need is a dust mask and the appropriate clothing, for example, overalls, gloves and safety spectacles. 
So when you have your spray, it's very important to calibrate it, especially for ultra low volume applications. So you need to sort out your flow rate. If you get the wrong flow rate, you're likely to run out of formulation halfway through your application and you don't want to do that. Ideally, you'd want a dedicated sprayer for that, although I appreciate that in most circumstances that's not possible. So you really want to clean um, any pesticide sprayers very, very well. And ideally, don't use one that's got fungicide in it. Metaresium is a fungus, the fungicide is likely to kill it. As, and as with all spraying, clean well after use. As I've said, disposal of the packs are relatively easy, they can just be burnt. Now, monitoring is important at all stages, so you want to monitor the locusts before they become a problem. But in this slide, I'm just talking about monitoring after you've applied your biopesticide. So prior to application, um, we marked out one meter squared uh, cages and we counted insects into the cages before application. We then put the application on and then went back twice a week to count the number of insects per application. And you would expect to see numbers to start to decrease after about seven days. However, you may not always see dead insects in the field. We had lots of problems with predation by natural enemies. Things like spiders um, would kill the nymphs. So you'd go there, you count them and they weren't there. Um, and when we were doing larger field trials in Africa, there were big problems of birds coming in and eating the locusts before they died. So when the locusts are infected but not quite dead, they're lethargic, they don't move as much, so they're easier for birds to capture. And that was a real problem in how do you quantify your experiments. It's not a problem that birds and spiders, for example, eat the infected locust because it's, it's been shown that it's not harmful to them and it doesn't go up through the food chain. Why are early warning systems important? Primarily, it because it gives us more time to deal with the locusts and grasshoppers before they become a problem. It gives us more management options. If you've got a locust swarm that are damaging crops today, really you can only put a chemical pesticide on to control them. If you know that they're hoppers, then you can put on your micro-insecticide. You can also put on barrier treatments. The hoppers are hopping in this direction. A spreader spraying the whole area. You just spray a barrier across, which reduces costs. You can allow farmers time to prepare for the pest invasion. And also as well, it means that you get less losses in crops and better livelihoods. In Africa, FAO have got an app called eLocus3. So if you're out in the field, you can input where you've seen locusts and what stage they are. And then all this information is fed back to FAO and then they can predict their early warning systems. And then they can also plug it into models. Um, and models are really good at helping detecting a potential problem before it arises, um, which means that then you can focus your limited resources in certain areas and it allows time for people to mobilise those resources. It's all very well saying we've detected locusts there, but to get people there and the product there to be able to control them takes time to do. Now, this graph here shows that all the little round dots are records that have been sent in about uh, nymphs and that information has then been put into model and it shows here that red is the very high probability between 80 and 100 percent probability that you're going to have an outbreak of desert locusts in that area. Now you can notice to the right hand side of the picture that there's red there but there isn't a single record from that area. And this is where modelling can really help. So they don't, perhaps traditionally locusts aren't in that area or they just don't have people available in that area. Um, so you can then think, right, OK, well, we're not going to concentrate on the blue areas. They don't need support this year, but these red areas need support. And especially we need to send someone to go and have a look in this area in the east because we don't normally have locusts there. But the model is suggesting that there might be a problem. In China, I had a project that looked at modelling locust development and a different model to work out how long it would take for a biopesticide to kill locusts. And we combine these models together to come up with an app called BioSuccess. If you look at the map on the left hand side, you'll see that um, you have pink at the bottom going for red, orange, yellow, greens, blues and black. 
And these colours represent how long it takes for the biopesticide to kill 90% of the locus. So that pink purple colour at the bottom takes 14 days to kill 90% of the population. If you look at the same area on the 15th of September, you'll see that half of the map now is coloured with pinks and purples. And this means that your biopesticide will work a lot quicker across most of China. And that is due to environmental parameters being more favourable for the biopesticide. So it's important to know that you can apply your biopesticide at different times of the year and it will work in a different way. So you've got this information and that's great and you've got your models. But if you cannot disseminate that information, then there really is no value to it. So you really have to think about how are you going to get this information to the end user. So for the uh, BioSuccess app that I've talked about, the individual user can do it themselves. Put in where they are, latitude, longitude, the date they sprayed, hit submit, and then it will say we would expect 90% of the population to be killed by such and such date. You can do it through government. So in China, uh, the information is all disseminated from the governments um, through official channels. In the UK, it's a service that has to be paid for. Normally, they're commercial services. You set it up uh, to send SMSs, text messages, um, high probability of wheat rust this year. You need to put on a fungicide, whatever that may be. And of course, if it's a big campaign, you can do it through TV, radio and social media. And finally, I'd just like to talk about drones that are becoming widely available today and have great potential for use for biopesticides. I had a project in Inner Mongolia working with the universities of Loughborough and Lincoln. Loughborough were mounting cameras onto drones and flying them over vegetation to see if they could detect locusts and hence then count the numbers. And the University of Lincoln developed an app where you could take a photo on your Android phone and it would calculate the number of locusts in that area. I also have a current project in China looking at spraying biopesticides using drones. Lots of work have been done with chemical pesticides, but not with biological pesticides. And as I mentioned before, as they're particles and they can settle out easily, they have different spray needs to chemicals. So in summary, microinsecticides are a viable alternative to chemical control, especially if they're used preventatively. So if you can just change your mind to thinking, I've got a pest problem, I need to deal with it, to what can we do to stop this small problem becoming a big problem. Green muscle has been shown to have better persistence um, in the field compared to chemical pesticides. Generally, they're environmentally very friendly, human friendly, um, and modelling a new technology can really help to use these uh, microinsecticides in a really good way. So if you use this new technology, you don't need to know the science behind it because the app and the models can do that for you. You can just spray and wait. And Cabby, of course, has the expertise to help with development of microinsecticides um, in South America. So if you're interested, please do get in contact with us. Thank you very much for your time. Goodbye.